Hey everyone, Greg Meskel here. Thanks for joining us with more At Home with USA Water Polo content. Monday, getting started a busy week here. And the theme of today's talk, we have five great talks ahead all this week. It's all about returning to play. And we know, and we want to say this up front, that depending on where you are in the country, you're at different areas. Some of you are back in the pool. Some of you are getting close to getting back in the pool. Some of you have not gotten back in the pool yet. So we understand that going in. And uh, we want to just talk about some of the kind of methodology and protocols places are going uh, through to either do what they're doing right now or start those steps to get back to play. Um, I am not qualified to answer these questions, so I've enlisted two of my good pals here, uh, Dr. Naresh Rao, who's worked with the USA men's national team and as a physician based in New York City and works with the New York Athletic Club, and Dr. Ray Kreinenkamp, who is based in the St. Louis, Missouri area and has done a lot in that community with local hospitals and water polo clubs to help uh, put together protocols as well. Guys, thanks for spending some time with us today. Good, thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Excellent. Uh, so Naresh, we'll, we'll start with you. And I, I think uh, the first question, because we get this a lot to our inbox, whether it's we get an email or a social media post, people want to know, when, when are you opening up? When, when does that happen? And USA Water Polo is not the arbiter of all pools, right? It's, it's very much a local decision. Can you give a little context to, to kind of how places decide to, to help fans understand this is not like a broad decision, but a very localized one? Yeah, well, thanks for the question, because it's a very common one. And uh, the ultimate answer is, how are we going to stop any transmission of this virus uh, from or minimize or mitigate is the big word we use. And in the pool, we know that uh, w there's two factors really with any gathering place. The first is how many people are going to be there. And two, what's the amount of time that you're going to have those people together? And what's the chances of those people having the virus, whether it be symptomatic, meaning with symptoms or with uh, no symptoms? So we try to look at how it's doing in the general population, and that's county by county. So we do have to work with the Department of Health, our local public health service. And uh, we're about to go into phase two, or we went into phase two here in New York City, so we don't have clearance uh, or at least a permit to open our pool in our club in the, um, you know, in the, in, in New York city itself, but up in Westchester where I live, which is just North, maybe about 10 miles North of New York city, we're in phase three known as the Hudson Valley. And so the lower Hudson Valley, we're going to open our pool, which is an outdoor pool different than in the city, which is indoor. So they do have different uh, aspects as you can imagine. We have to take into consideration but the outdoor pool, we're, we're, we're tentatively going to open up on Friday the 26th. Um, and there's going to be a whole slew of conversations of how many people, what's going to be the number of people per lane. And there's a lot of USA swimming guidelines that we're using. But we're safely going to say that there's no congregating at the pool. There's going to be um, just purely swimming. And we're going to have a shower. And then the next shower is going to be empty. And the next shower you could use but really limiting the amount of time you spend there uh, in 90 minutes from the, when you walk in and check in to getting changed and showered first, then do your swimming and then shower up and leave. And you have to get all that has to happen in an hour and a half. For, for any of us that have been to the water park back in the day, you used to get the bracelet and it was, you got two hours and then all the green bracelets have to leave. And now it's time for the blue bracelet. Sounds a bit like that. Ray, you're, you're, you're working a lot of the similar stuff in your area in St. Louis. Can you describe kind of on your end what the process has been like to kind of develop how people can get back in the water? Right. So I, I've been really encouraged by um, all the water polo clubs in our area trying their best to come up with a socially responsible plan for, for going back to water polo. Um, in our area, uh, we haven't had as many cases, but we certainly have had um, a, a decent number to where we need to we've needed to consider this virus when when making our policies. Um, last last week, uh, June 15 was when the pools opened in our area, and uh, there's still a lot of guidelines from St. Louis County as far as um, what what we're allowed to do. But um, the the physicians in our area came up with four phases of returning to play. Um, we are currently in phase one of returning to play where now we have our pools open, but um, still really encouraging social distancing, 
staying at least six feet, feet away from anyone participating in a, an activity in the pool. Um, also, limiting substantially the number of people that are there. So um, right now, still trying to stay in groups of less than 10, um, just to ensure that we're doing everything we can to mitigate the spread of this virus. Um, in the next phase two, which will hopefully be next week, um, the plan is to open things up a little bit more to where we might be able to do some more water polo like activities where we can get a little bit closer than six feet. Um, and then all these phases are contingent on the number of cases in our area continuing to go down and not, not seeing any increase in spread. But uh, after, if, if that continues, we hope to be in, in the first week or two of July being able to actually play water polo. But um, we, we have this design so that if we start seeing an increase in cases, we can do our best to try and uh, not contribute to that. Yeah, you, both of you mentioned phases, and, and Naresh, you, you were talking about being where you live 10 miles away from another area. I think a lot of people are going through this where they're in one phase, and their, their friend or their cousin or someone is 10 miles away, and they're ahead of them, and you're seeing it with businesses and hair salons and all that sort of stuff, and we're seeing it with pools as well. Naresh, I was thinking of you too, because I know you've done a lot with helping athletes with sport injuries. And, and the patients required to rehab an injury, it reminds me a little bit of the patients needed here. It is a bit of a, a uh, slow go, wait, wait and see approach, right? You're working hard in that rehab to get back on the field or in the pool. And it's a bit like this, right? You can only pass certain barriers once it's safe to do so. It sounds like that's how these phases are working. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, so when we talk about phased approaches, it is based upon the number of cases that are, that are positive. And we're looking at what we call infectivity rates. We're looking at different statistical numbers, which I won't get into. I'm sure, I'm sure Ray will, uh, as the MD, PhD, I'm sure would be more than happy to share his expertise on that. But uh, from a clinical standpoint, uh, it does come into play for us to say, if we're in phase one, clearly we have a lot more cases than if we're in phase two, as if in phase three and then phase four. So if we look at the, the chances of there being a recurrence or a setback or whatever you want to use, uh, where we have to go backwards, that's really the problem because that will then might not necessarily be, oh, we got to wait another two weeks. It might be a prolonged course. We know we're seeing that in Europe right now and in Serbia, certainly you've probably seen, you know, they're, they, you know they, had, they have to pause their whole program in Serbia now because of it. And it's nobody's fault. It's just that that's how contagious this virus is. Yeah, there's news coming out today that the, that the head coach of the, of the men's Serbian national team having coronavirus, we of course send him our well wishes. Hope, hope Coach Dan Savage is feeling well soon. Ray, uh, Naresh alluded to the numbers here. I think as, as people that want to get back in the pool or if you think about USA Water Polo members, you know, we're all kind of passively watching to see, well, what, what is a good trend? What, what should I be looking for? You're, you're someone who's, who's kind of keeping an eye on these things to, to know perhaps when you can proceed from phase one to two to three. For the average Water Polo fan, what, what should they be looking for maybe to give them a sense of, of if their area is moving in the right direction or they're going backwards or where they're at? Yeah, so I think the local health departments are really key to this and guiding us in what we can and should be thinking about doing. I mean, I, I was looking at the CDC website today and uh, numbers of new cases are still occurring. I mean, the numbers of new cases yesterday were comparable to the number that we were seeing at the end of May. So um, while they, we may not be getting as much press about this um, in the news. It's, it's still a consideration that we definitely need to have. In, in some areas of our country, particularly um, some areas of the South, um, numbers are continuing to go up. I saw in California in the last week, we've had, of the total number of cases they've had, 16% have occurred in the last week. So um, it is still something that we need to be thinking about, um, but ultimately for each area, the, the best source of information is the health department and getting guidance from them on whether it is safe to continue advancing and having more activity or whether or not we need to stay where we are or scale back. Yeah, you bring up a great point. And, and for those that are asking, we saw uh, some folks that are watching now on Facebook as well. 
I think it falls under two buckets, right? If, if your facility is open and what some of those protocols are, uh, your, your county or your local health department will share some of that data, but then you also will find information, whether it's USA Water Polo, USA Swimming, that might share, well, here are some best practices of how to operate if you're in a facility. But Naresh, I'm sure the average person is saying, well, how do I make sense of these two things, right? I'm, you know, I'm hearing things, I'm seeing people back in the water in different areas, but how does that uh, connect to what my local area is allowing us to do? Yeah, the, uh, the question is, is a paramount concern because we can read a textbook how do you apply what the information is to what the current situation is, which can change day to day. And so what we talk about is using your local resources. So for example, raised in St. Louis, I'm in New York. I'm the local consultant for the New York Athletic Club. And there's three other people on our membership, on our health and safety committee that's been specially appointed. And so we all work together to be able to do that. And so I implore uh, that, that everybody find medical experts to help interpret what this what this means for for not for nothing else than just the safety and of course the continuation as we go from face to face mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 really so important and later this week on our usa water Polo social media pages we'll be sharing images from different uh clubs around the country that have gotten back to play but it is so important that everyone knows that those specific clubs they're following what works in their area. And as Naresh alluded to, it might be literally a situation where one club is doing the things that work for their county and a club that they in regular times play with all the time is in a different county and has to follow different rules. So just important for people to keep that in mind. I'm sure it is frustrating if you feel like you're in a similar area and things are different. But Ray, as we, as we turn back to your area, what are, what are some of the common questions you feel like come up? Just uh, an FAQ, if you will, Think, things that you feel like you're hearing a lot and that answers you've been able to, to work with to provide that have been helpful to people. So, yeah, I, I definitely have gotten a lot of questions, which, as I said, I think is a great reflection on a number of the clubs trying their best to be socially responsible. I think a couple of things that have certainly come up is how to screen athletes. Um, that's That's something that's been in the news a lot that uh, especially we want to make sure that people that are coming to practice and playing water polo um, are not at risk of transmitting the coronavirus to some of their teammates. So um, coaches have been asking what's, what's the best way of doing that. And uh, over the last week, couple weeks, there's been a couple really nice videos on put out by various health departments about how to do that. But just as far as um, asking about fevers, cough, shortness of breath, loss of taste, taste or smell, um, vomiting or diarrhea, all those things are things that um, it, people should be screening for before they go back. Um, it's really incumbent that uh, we make sure that we're, by screening, we're possibly preventing people um, from entering that could uh, cause, cause increase in the virus transmission. So a lot of questions about that. Um, I've also heard a lot of questions about numbers. I mean, it, as, as Naresh talked about earlier, certainly um, risk of transmitting the virus goes up as more people are in a certain area. So I think trying to decide what's a good number, and particularly with uh, with pool costs and, and being able to get facility time, um, getting a number of people in there that makes sense for the coaches to be there and be able to uh, conduct meaningful practices versus um, what, what we need to do to keep the virus from spreading. And, and each of those is also a very individualized decision, but um, you should be trying to keep in mind that we want to be trying to keep numbers limited where we can, people working with the same group. Uh, I know some clubs often have practices back to back and talking a little bit about staggering start and end time so that all these people aren't mingling together um, to put and once again, potentially stop um, the spread of the virus if in fact someone unfortunately has it. Right, just to follow up on one of your questions there because it was, it was an important topic, athlete screening. I think people are asking that question a lot. I'm sure there's some water polo coaches who might say to themselves, well, like, I'm not a doctor, I'm not, I'm not qualified to know. I mean, I can, I can give my own kid a temperature check, but is that, is that something, and I know it's early and we have to stress guidelines will, will adjust and knowledge will increase, but, but thus far, is that a thing that 
the average water polo coach will be conducting, they'll be, they'll be doing these checks or should that be some other third party to kind of monitor that? I mean, it, it should be something that, I mean, most water polo clubs don't necessarily have an athletic trainer or a yeah. doctor around who would be able to do these things. I mean, in an ideal situation, it would be great um, to have one of those people. But I, but the goal is that any water polo coach should be able to ask these simple questions. And uh, hopefully just by asking them, it's causing the athletes and participants to be mindful of these things to where they know, hey, I'm going to be going to practice and I'm going to be asked these questions. Maybe if, maybe if I'm having one of these symptoms, I should not, not, not be going. So I think even, even if you don't necessarily have a medical background, I think being comfortable with asking these questions um, is something that we should become accustomed to. That, that's an excellent point. And, and if you've been reading a lot about this, you're, you're probably thinking about some of my questions and saying, I know already, but I'm taking a very broad approach for those that are a bit uncertain about this and are kind of still getting their way uh, back into the pool. Arash, you talked about being on the committee with the New York Athletic Club, and, and that was assembled to bring some professionals together. What are some of the other questions that your group is tackling every time you talk or get together virtually? Yeah, we have uh, a, a system of working with our staff who is using the resources in our, in, our, in our geographic area. And then that gets approved by the membership, which means it gets approved by, by us, the, the safety committee, the health and safety committee, which then gets pushed down to the board and then it gets, gets implemented by the staff again. So our general manager, Roger Simon, has done a great job to put it together. Our, Director of Athletics, uh, Cedric Jones, uh, that they all work together to be able to make sure that one staff is safe, members are safe, and of course that there's no recurrence as we push forward. And as you can imagine, uh, there's many aspects than just about pool uh, care uh, or, or the pool in certain areas. For example, there might be multiple uh, things going on where the pool is, where depending on where you're at. So you have to take in, let's say there's concessions, for example. Well obviously concessions is going to come in later because it's just an area where people congregate. And of course you worry about workers there. So you want to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, the, the other part is, is the, um, you, you know, the ability to, to, to work with, with the facility that you're with because the facility in itself most often is not owned by the water polo club, right? That's usually rented. So you'll find that they're going to have a lot of restrictions and regulations that need to be understood. For example, there's waivers, there's things to, to, to limit liability, and that gets out of my purview. Uh, that's, where we, that's why we have a lawyer on our health and, uh, our, our health and safety committee to be able to understand those, those other implications. And Craig, can I... Oh, sorry, Can I add one point, Greg? So one other question that I, I have also gotten a lot of, which I think is an important one, is the use of masks. I mean, that's something that uh, has come up uh, a lot. Um, you've seen some of it on the news. But uh, my advice to all water polo athletes and families is that we should be using masks um, when we can. Uh, if, you're, if you're old enough to play water polo, you're old enough to wear a mask. And obviously, when you're in the pool, you're not going to be wearing a mask. But when we're in facilities and before we're coming in, I think, I mean, research has shown or stories have shown that the use of masks is preventing the spread of the virus. I know here in Missouri, there was that case of uh, where two hairdressers were working with uh, over 100, 100 uh, individuals and everyone was wearing a mask and no one got coronavirus. So I think it's really important, particularly for the families and any spectators. I mean, as we know, coronavirus is at this point more uh, of a concern for older individuals. And I think especially in the stands, that's something that we really should be emphasizing. And I think I, I would really encourage all coaches to be encouraging their parents and anyone that's gonna be at the pool facility to be using a mask when they can. That's excellent advice, Ray. We're talking with Dr. Ray Kreinkamp, Dr. Naresh Rao about uh, general return to play protocols and, and methodology. And, and you bring up a great point and not to segue this into just a, you know, a giant public health talk, but I think people do, do watch a lot of things and they're uncertain. You have people that are on one, one feeling about this where they have known someone who has had this. And so they, they know firsthand the seriousness of it. And then there, there are others 
in our water polo community and elsewhere that have not had any anyone that they know personally be involved in, so it doesn't feel as real. Naresh, I, I gather you have patients, you have people that are that are that are coming to you to say, like, I want to do the right thing here, but is this really a thing I need to worry about? I'm age this or I'm age that or I feel super healthy. How do you address those general questions to people? Well, being in the epicenter of the world where coronavirus uh, happened to be, unfortunately, uh, you know, we learned really quick uh, how sick people can get. Uh, of course, we look at unfortunate death rates and hospitalization rates and, uh, you know, and, and, and to be able to understand for my personal self that I've been in the city almost every single day since this thing's been, been happening. And, you know, when I see, uh, when I see my colleagues really going through struggles, when I see my own, my, my own uh, contacts going through things, it's real. So to, to raise point, absolutely. Masks, masks, masks. There's no doubt about it. It needs to be worn. I absolutely 100% need to make sure, just as Ray does, everyone needs to wear a mask. Secondly, six feet apart. It's scientific. These are as good as medications. You know, just to say, look, you do these two things and you isolate if you're sick, you know, you're most likely going to be fine. However, we know that many of us will be living with people who may have uh, you know, they might have some issues that might make them at risk for developing complications from COVID, uh, from, from the coronavirus. So COVID-19, as we know, can, can affect every single age population. So there's no reason to think that, oh, because I'm young, I'm not going to get it, or yes, I'm going to get it very mildly. No, I'm sorry. I've seen it here. It's, it's happening at every age group. And yes, the elderly who tend to have more, more health issues are the ones who are getting sicker, but it does not exclude anybody. And I'm sure Ray, as a pediatrician, I'm sure you could attest to that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of cases at uh, my hospital as well. And yeah, it does not, does not spare kids. Um, so it's definitely something you need to be cognizant of no matter what age. And, and, and we share that not to you know, scare anyone or make them afraid, but just to deliver some real talk about, about what's, what's going on and how you need to be prepared. And we're talking, uh, as well to our to our water polo community here about getting back to play. That's the theme of this week, return to play. And, and our first talk here with uh, with uh, Ray and Arish, really diving into kind of how areas are deciding. So both of you have talked about the phased approach, and that is is something that you hear around the country, depending on where you live, in different phases. Ray, as as you look forward, and you were talking about the pools in your area opening last week, if things progress on a good track. And I'm sure you're getting this question, hey, when do we get back to, to playing some real games? What does that look like? Is, is, it, is it hard to even forecast that because you're waiting to see what data comes in? I'm sure every water polo kid you come in contact in wants to know, hey, is next St. Louis high school season going to be okay? Right. No, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's the question everybody certainly is asking. I know in Missouri, a lot of the high schools are starting to try and figure out what they're going to be doing for fall sports. And I, I think right now our goal is with these phases, we're hoping that by the beginning of August, we'll be able to be playing these sports and um, semi back to normal. I think especially this fall, some of the travel that sometimes normally happens is something that uh, may not be possible, but that's why, that's why I think it's really important that not only we as water polo athletes and fans uh, adhere to these guidelines, um, but also that, I mean, our communities do as well, because if, if we're, we adhere to these, I think we increase the chance that we'll be able to do the things that we love doing um, when, when time rolls around, either fall or spring, whenever your water polo season um, usually is. And similar thought to Uniration, you know, you work with Team USA. You know, everyone is is on eggshells hoping Olympics happen next year. That's still a long way off. But uh, whether it's high-level college water polo, it's national team stuff, it sounds like, uh, you know, cautious optimism is the name of the game here. Yeah, absolutely. Cautious optimism. And if we stay disciplined and you know, being in New York, I can only speak about New York, but you can see our rates have dropped tremendously compared to where we were at the peak. So if we stay in the scientifically based way to keep distancing, wearing masks, 
to the best we can, we can keep these numbers as low as possible. And if we can do that across uh, this over a period of time, and hopefully, and, and this is of course the most important thing, waiting for our vaccine, right? So once we get to our vaccine, hopefully by the end of 2020, early 2021, if possible, if we can bridge that gap from now till then with being disciplined, and then of course we have our, um, our, our JOs, which are happening of course uh, tentatively in, uh, well, well they're, they're, they should happen in uh, November, December, but that's all dependent on the data. Are we, are we going to be able to be disciplined enough to, to keep our local teams in the locality instead of saying, oh, my locality has low rates and then we travel to a high place and then we come back and we bring it back. You can imagine how complicated it gets. So, so stay local, stay disciplined, and we should be able to get through this. Yeah, you're, you're seeing it in pro sports right now as the NBA is trying to restart uh, the major league soccer, baseball is still in the talks. Believe me, these leagues want to get back to play, and they are going through all of the conversations and calculations. Uh, you know, and you can you can put water polo right in the mix of of a group of people that wants to play but wants to do it safely. Guys, this has been super informative. Just as we wrap up here, just um, Ray touched on it again at the top, but but just to kind of reiterate. Um, I know it's different for every area, but where people should go in their area to access the important information that'll inform what's going on in their community and potentially uh, when their facilities can open. Yeah, so I know like in St. Louis, for instance, the, in St. Louis County, St. Louis City, they put out recommendations from the health department for what you can do or what, what their guidelines are. So I, most cities or health departments across the country have recommendations. And one thing that I would like to point out is that even if even if you're having trouble finding them, I know that I'm on the St. Louis uh, Committee for Return to Sports. We love having questions come in about what's the best way about going returning to sports. I mean, that shows people are thinking about the proper way of doing things, which is something we always like seeing. So even if you cannot find the guidelines, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that there's someone at the health department or some hospital near you who would love to help out because we know that by people going back responsibly, we're hopefully going to be playing the sports we love sooner and preventing uh, COVID-19 from increasing in numbers. A couple of key words uh, Ray mentioned there, acting responsibly. We talked about cautious optimism, right? If, you, if you've watched this 30 minutes and thought, well, I, I didn't get a lot of concrete answers on when my team is going to play. Unfortunately, that's part of the deal right now. As, as, as both of these guys who are a lot smarter than I am have alluded to, uh, it is a lot of analyzing data. It is understanding the numbers around you. It is making the, you know, the, the best informed decision before moving forward so that uh, nobody gets hurt or sick any further. Naresh, your final thoughts here, you know, again, to reiterate, I know only speaking to your area, but, but anything else people should know as they kind of work through this process of getting ready to return to play? Well, it's my, it's my age old uh, saying, you know, be ready for anything every single day. And with that said, you can never do anything alone. Remember, you have people who are experts in these fields. Use them. There are local resources, just like Ray was saying. You do not have to do this in a vacuum. Do not be motivated by, oh, I need to be ready by this date. It's, you'll be ready when you're ready. We're fighting a law of nature. The coronavirus does not have an agenda. It just has, it just does what it does. And we have to react to it whenever we can at what's within our control. So please be smart, be safe, and make sure that you use your local resources. That, that's and excellent Greg, stuff. Good, yeah, go ahead, Greg, Greg, real good. quickly, we, we didn't touch a lot on this, but I just wanted to bring it up. I know this will come up later in the week as well, but one, one other concern about returning to sports is making sure we're going back to sports gradually. Um, I, I've heard talk about um, concern for a number of injuries that are gonna happen with people having been out of the pool for so long. I know this is something that Naresh is probably seeing just about every day now um, as people return to sports. But um, please, coaches, be cognizant about what athletes are doing when they go back. Um, some of these, some people have, have not hit this long out of the pool in a decade or even longer. So it's important to make sure we're not sending our athletes back and putting them back full speed. Otherwise, um, I think we're 
going to be up for a lot of injuries. So that's just one other point that's not necessarily related to the COVID, but something else we need to be very cognizant of as we return. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. And, and I was going to add to that, we've had a bunch of talks. If you, if you go back and look on the USA Water, Water Polo YouTube page with uh, Olympic gold medalists telling you they're not, they're, they're not ready to play right now at the level they're usually at. So the very best players we have know they have not been in the water, they have to get back in the water, and they have to ramp up to where they were, right? Everyone was at a certain spot, you know, March 1st, and it's understandable if you haven't been in the pool, uh, you're not going to be where you were. You should know it's okay. Every person, every coach, every athlete will tell you that is fine. You're not going to have to go for the championship on the first day of practice to raise point. And we'll talk about this more with some other physicians this week about working your way back in because nobody wants to be hurt, right? You don't want to go through all of this and then get back in the pool and get injured. So um, just, just some final thoughts there. Uh, Dr. Naresh Rao, Dr. Ray Karnikamp, always good to talk with you guys. Read their stuff in Skip Shot Magazine, and thanks for uh, taking some time with us today.